It's so nice to see you, and I hope that you're all doing well. Uh, my name is Stephanie Nakagawa, and I'm very excited to be here today to talk to you about my two works, uh, the Canadian Opera Aria Anthologies for Soprano, Volumes 1 and 2, published by Counterpoint Music Library Services. So I'll tell you a little bit about my journey and how these anthologies came about. Um, I'm a soprano and I did my master's degree at Indiana University and then I did my doctoral degree at the University of British Columbia. Um, my doctoral thesis was the creation of the Canadian Opera Aria Anthology and it was the first of its kind for Canadian opera and these publications that I'll be showing you today uh, were developed from this research. Um, like all of you, I've spent most of my life studying music as a student, performer, teacher, and now adjudicator. And what I noticed from all these perspectives is that there's a lack of Canadian opera repertoire being sung. We singers are always being asked to sing contemporary English arias, especially as a criteria for music festivals or program auditions. Um, but have you noticed it's almost always British or American repertoire that we turn to for this? And so, um, what we hear a lot is um, lots of sopranos sing songs from Ballad of Baby Doe or Minotti's Aria or No Word from Tong from The Rake's Progress, for example. But what we don't hear are many Canadians singing Canadian arias. So why is that? Well, I'll tell you the first challenge Canadian opera faces is that once an opera is performed, it's rarely performed again. We have lots of amazing new works being created, but they don't often get a repeat performance. And so that leads us to the second challenge of Canadian opera. Most of it's unpublished. So unless you can get a hold of the composer or you know one of the singers who sang in the production, it's impossible to find a score. I will note the Canadian Music Centre is an amazing resource and has many opera scores available, but still a lot of Canadian opera repertoire is still inaccessible. And so how do we singers and teachers and pianists get our hands on the music to perform these works? So that's what we've done with these anthologies. We've brought Canadian opera to you in an easily accessible format. And these two books are the Canadian Opera Aria Anthology, volumes one and two. And each one contains about a dozen arias from a variety of operas in musical styles, um, ranging from one of the very first Canadian operas ever written, The Widow, by Calixa Lavallee, written in 1881, uh, to some very new operas that just premiered or that are soon to be premiered, such as Dragon's Tale by Kanin Chan, uh, which is being produced by Tapestry Opera. So here's a list of the operas in the anthology. Uh, the, this list can also be found on Counterpoint Music's um, publishing website. Uh, so just to highlight a few of the works, we have the favorite Storm Aria from the Canadian opera hit Philomena by John Estacio and John Morrell. We also have many other operas drawn from Canadian history, such as Iron Road by Kanin Chan and Mark Brownell. And this opera depicts the struggles and unfair treatment of the Chinese laborers who helped build the Canadian Pacific Railway. And it combines Cantonese and English, and it's the very first Canadian opera to do this, making it quite unique. The aria Cool Mountain Water is a beautiful aria for a lyric soprano. There's also Mary's Wedding by Andrew McDonald and Stephen Massacott, which depicts the romance story of a young couple from Saskatchewan um, that were separated during World War I. And it's based on the award-winning play by Massacott, which you should definitely watch or read. It's heartbreakingly beautiful, and it has a great aria for lyric soprano. Uh, we also have an aria from Stick Boy by Neil Weisensel and spoken word poet Shane Coisen, which is an autobiographical story that Shane wrote, uh, depicting the traumatic bullying he suffered as a child. And the valedictorian's aria from this opera reminds me a lot of Laurie's song from the Tenderland by Aaron Copeland. Um, a lot of soubrettes sing that aria, and so I think this is a great introductory aria for soubrettes as well, or young voices just starting to approach opera repertoire. Uh, the music also has a bit of a, a pop influence and feel to it, which I think would appeal to younger singers. Uh, and just to highlight a few other unique operas that are in these anthologies, we also have an aria in the French language by Marc Gagné based on H.W. Longfellow's poem Evangeline. Uh, the opera tells the story of two lovers in the 1700s who were separated by British forces during the Great Upheaval, in which over 11,000 Acadians were forcibly deported from their homes. There's also an aria from When the Sun Comes Out by Leslie Ueda and Rachel Rose. It's Canada's first lesbian opera 
which explores the oppression that people in the LGBTQ community face and the risks they take in nations where homosexuality is illegal. The aria Solana's song is an amazing aria for coloratura. It's about 10 minutes long and it's a showstopper for sure. And yes, all these stories seem to be about pretty heavy stuff, but opera is dramatic and Canadian opera is all that and more. But don't worry, we also have um, some wonderful uplifting and fun arias, such as Rapunzel's aria, Above the World from Brothers Grimm by Dean Burry. And this opera tells a tale of the Grimm brothers and it brings to life all our favorite fairy tale characters. It's adorable. And we also have an aria from Flight of the Hummingbird by Maxime Goulet, Michael Nicole Yagulanas, and Barry Gilson, which depicts an indigenous story well known throughout Haida culture that teaches children about climate change and the power of small steps to achieve a big goal. And all these forest animals come together to save their home from a raging forest fire. So both of these operas were written for school tour productions, as well as the opera Stick Boy I mentioned earlier. And so they all um, have wonderful arias for soubrette or light lyric voices, and all of them would serve as really great introductory opera repertoire for younger singers. So what's inside these anthologies? First, of course, we have the piano vocal score of the arias, all of which have been digitalized so that they're clear and easy to read. Uh, we also worked with a lot of the composers to make aria adaptations so that these arias could be um, sung as standalone works. Uh, we also include background info about the operas, and one of the most important things I feel for performers is a full detailed synopsis. Because many of these operas are unpublished, singers can't go through the libretto and read it. And it's not like we can just Google these stories either, because for most of these works, there isn't much online material about them. So how do singers find out what they're singing about? And that's why we've included not just a general synopsis of the overall opera, but a synopsis specific to the character in the aria. This way, singers know what is important and how to interpret the music and text. Uh, so now let's take a look at a few of these works. So first is one of my favorite arias from the anthologies, and it's called I Need You, Guillaume, from the opera Transit of Venus. Uh, it was written by Victor Davies and Maureen Hunter. And this aria can be found in volume one of the anthologies. Uh, just a note, there's also another aria from the same opera called No, You Don't Understand, uh, that's sung by the same character and can be found in volume two. Uh, so here's a bit of background info about the opera and a synopsis, just like you would find in the anthology notes. Transit of Venus premiered at Manitoba Opera in 2007. The opera takes place in 18th century France and follows the true life story of astronomer Guillaume le Gentil de la Galassière and his struggles between love and ambition. The opera's three acts span 11 years in which Gentil, le Gentil sorry, twice sails off to India, and both times he fails to chart the transits. So before his first expedition, he enters into a scandalous relationship with Celeste, an adolescent girl 20 years his junior, who also happens to be the daughter of one of his past lovers. So during his second expedition, Le Gentil gets lost at sea, and everyone presumes he's died. And five years later, he comes home and he finds that his house has been sold, his mother's gone sea now, uh, his young assistant Demeray has died, and Celeste has become pregnant with Demeray's child. So despite Celeste's infidelity, Le Gentil begs her to marry him, but she refuses and instead emigrates to the New World to start her life. And Le Gentil is left all alone with nothing but his lost ambitions. So in I Need You, Guillaume, six years have passed since Le Gentil first left to chart Venus's transit. And during his absence, Celeste has spent all her time making maps of his travels and reading his books and letters just to feel him, to feel closer to him. And now he has just told her that he plans on leaving again. And Celeste just angrily refuses to marry him and desperately pleads with him to stay with her. Despite her protests, Le Gentil eventually convinces her to wait for him again. And so now I will be singing I Need You, Guillaume with the wonderful Dr. Joy Innes at the piano. to me. 
Thank you, Dr. Innes. <laughs> so next we have the Storm Aria. If you're familiar with any Canadian opera, it's probably this one. Uh, this is a wonderful aria for lyric color to our voice, and it's become quite a popular audition aria that I'm happy to say it's that it's making its way into the standard operatic repertoire. Uh, Philomena was produced by Calgary Opera and the Banff Center, and it premiered in 2003 and has since become the most produced Canadian opera. The opera is set during the 1920s Prohibition era, and it follows the life of Philomena Lissandro, the only woman to ever be hanged in Alberta. And after being forced into a loveless marriage with Charlie Lissandro, Philomena gets swept up in Alberta's flourishing underground bootlegging trade, run by the infamous rum-running kingpin Emilio Picariello. And she gets involved in a scandalous relationship with Picariello's son, Steve. So on September 21st, 1922, Filomena and Picaliero were involved in a shootout that led to the death of Constable Steve Lawson. And due to this incident, incident they were both sentenced to death and executed on May 2nd, 1923. So the storm aria takes place in Act 1, Scene 1 on Filomena's wedding day where she's overwhelmed by conflicting emotions, especially after she had just met Steve, to whom she is immediately attracted to. And in the distance she sees a storm brewing, its presence gives her the strength to begin her new life. This is a recording that I found off of YouTube. I believe this is Laura Whalen who premiered the role singing in the original Calgary opera production. Be 
So the storm aria is included in volume one of the anthologies, but there's also a second aria from Philomena um, that we included in volume two. It's called May God Forgive Him. I love this aria. Um, it occurs at the end of the opera when Philomena and Picadiello await their execution, and she reflects upon her life and, and finally accepts her death as a storm brews in the distance. It's a beautiful aria and very dramatic. Um, so the next opera I'll talk about uh, is... Uh, Red Emma by Gary Kalisha and Carol Bolt. And it was commissioned by the Canadian Opera Composer in Residence program. And it premiered in 1995. It's based on the play by Carol Bolt and portrays a life of anarchist and activist Emma Goldman, uh, who lived from 1869 to 1940. Goldman played an important role in the development of anarchist political philosophy, and through the influence of feminist and anarchist scholars, her life arose from obscurity and became a topic of interest during the 1970s. I won't get into the whole plot for this aria, uh, but to give you a quick setting, this aria is sung by Emma's friend, Helen, and Helen is secretly in love with the same man as Emma, whose name is Johann Most, and he's the leader of this anarchist movement. And Johann favors Emma, and so in this aria, Why Am I So Pale Beside Her, in, from Act One, Helen reflects on how overshadowed she always feels by Emma. And so th I think this is a beautiful aria for a lyric soprano. Here it is.
So in addition to these two soprano anthologies, um, we're also creating anthologies for other voice types. And uh, we're currently working on a baritone volume with composer Dr. John Beckwith. And the next aria that you will hear is from this upcoming anthology. Uh, the aria is I Was in Love from the opera Orpheus and Eurydice by James Rolfe and Andre Alexis. And the opera was premiered in 2004 by the Toronto Mask Theatre. Uh, performing the aria for us today is baritone Corin Thomas Smith, who was named as one of CBC's music's 30 hot Canadian classical musicians under 30 in 2021. <laughs> <laughs> and he is a graduate of the University of Toronto Masters of Opera program, and he's currently completing his Masters of Musical Arts in Opera at Yale University. He has collaborated with Tapestry Opera, Against the Grain Theatre, and many more. And he has also been a fellow at the Ravinia Music Festival, Music Academy of the West, and the Aspen Music Festival. So here is Corin and Dr. Joy Innes singing I Was in Love from Orpheus and Eurydice. I would just like to start off by saying, not that type of hot. <laughs> it just means current. in love as I have never been. I had left the city for the quiet life of fields and pastures to be free of love, to be free of trouble. How naive, how naive to think the goddess of love could not find me. From the moment I saw Irene, I loved, I loved. gazing at her face as if I were looking up at the great constellations. What need had I for stars or clouds? Irene's was the most beautiful face I have ever seen. I could not forget, no, I could not forget. It was as if I had looked at the sun and could see nothing but the sun even when I closed my eyes. I could see it still. I could see it still. Thank you. Thank you so much, Corin. Um, sorry, one second. Um, 
So, and, and now, unfortunately, Victor couldn't be here today um, due to some personal matters, but I'm sure many of you are familiar with his name. He is one of Canada's most prolific composers, and he has written many wonderful operas, such as Transit of Venus, The Importance of Being Earnest, and The Ecstasy of Rita Joe, just to name a few. He is a member of the Order of Canada and has received Honorary Doctorate of Laws from the University of Manitoba and Indiana University. And when I was reading about Victor's amazing accomplishments, I came across a passage that the Order of Canada wrote about Victor in which they describe him as a fierce supporter of Canada's creative musical community, and I couldn't agree more. And so since he couldn't be here today, I thought I'd tell you a little story about him. Um, when I was just starting my thesis, I was interviewing all these composers over the phone to find out more about their works. and. Um, I think Victor was the second composer that I called, and he was the most kind and jolly man, and he was just so sweet, and he told me so many great stories. I think we talked for over two hours. Uh, my phone battery died. <laughs> so, um, But the one thing he kept telling me was, Stephanie, this work you're doing, it's so important. Canadian opera needs this. Composers and singers need this. You know, keep going. And so um, two years later, I was part of a PhD's Go Public initiative, and I was given funding to present uh, lecture recitals across Canada. And so I did one in Toronto, and I got to meet Victor, and he came to watch, and afterwards he said, Stephanie, you have to get this anthology published. And, and that's when he got me in touch with CounterPoint Publishing, and now we're here today with two volumes out. So really, his encouragement is one of the main reasons this anthology is published and out there in the world today. And for that, I am truly thankful for his kindness and support. Um, so here is a little clip Victor sent us um, where he talks about what he thinks of the anthology. So uh, we're all not so great at tech, so he did this over Zoom. So yeah, here we go. <laughs> I hope it plays. Mm, it's uh, it's uh, very important because, um, you know, uh, buried in every uh, good opera, there are uh, gems of areas. Uh, and uh, unless uh, somebody brings them uh, to light, then um, they're buried in the score and some uh, library or some uh, composer's shelf. And um, so the uh, anthologist um, makes a judgment about um, the um, viability of the aria and uh, their appeal and use for uh, soloists. Uh, and so uh, right away, you, uh, there's a bunch of filters set up that uh, when the, the uh, anthologist is presenting these areas to the performer. Um, uh, by, by that, I mean the uh, uh, singers don't have to hunt through scores uh, to find a repertoire which is uh, suitable for their voice and um, all that stuff. And also the, um, the um, placement of the aria and the opera and uh, the story of the opera guides uh, the singer in terms of uh, performing the material. And so um, the anthology is uh, very important in terms of uh, the individual areas and also um, the uh, acquainting the uh, producers and um, singers with the, uh, uh, the opera that the area came from uh, to interest them and the work itself. So um, many, many um, pl pluses in terms of um, the these works and also the fact that they're put into books uh, with uh, a soprano um, baritone and everything else uh, the singer uh, the uh, singer the coach uh, don't have to dig in um, all these uh, very uh, uh, you know um, secret places uh, composers that are not keeping them secret, but um, 
they're sitting on them on their shelves so <laughs> Victor is so sweet. He's really the best. Um, so as I explained earlier, we created these anthologies to make Canadian opera accessible to Canadian singers and beyond. But what my hopes are is that singers and teachers and pianists like you take these anthologies and perform these Canadian arias so that everyone gets a chance to hear them. And as Victor said to me the other day, um, and what he just said here was that buried within every good opera, there are gems of arias. And unless someone brings them to life, they're buried in the score, in some library, and gathering dust on the composer's shelf. So from your performances, opera companies will hear these gems in your auditions, and fellow musicians will hear them at recitals, and all your audiences will hear them and take interest in this music, and take interest in these stories about our Canadian history. And maybe somewhere along the way, the, uh, these arias will become a part of our standard operatic repertoire. And these Canadian operas will see the stage again. So uh, thank you everyone for your time today and for joining us on our exploration of Canadian opera. I thought we could use this extra time and um, have some questions if you have any for me. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. No questions? Yes, Corey. Uh, what's the process like for, for sourcing and finding all these uh, artists? How do you select which ones are what make the cut? Yes, thank you, Jamie. Okay. <laughs> so say it and I will repeat it. Oh, uh, what's the process of choosing the arias? What's the process of choosing the arias? Um, the videotape people so they hear your question. Okay. Yes. Um, so when, when I was first doing the, the, this as my thesis, um, I basically went to the Canadian Music Center because that's all I knew. And then I just sat there and I went through every single score and just piled them up. And I looked for any, any like lengthy section of music. And then from there, I kind of sorted through them and, and looked at what, what was acceptable, really. Um, and it's really tricky. Like we, we were trying to find a French aria, a French language aria for this. And just there were tons of operas in French, but there weren't many acceptable arias um, because a lot of it's ensemble and stuff now, especially um, more of the contemporary works. They, they don't have standalone arias anymore. They really do kind of, you know, have lots of dialogue. Um, so it was tricky. But and now that the first two volumes are out, um, Jean Marie sent out emails to people and and um, people have been using the books that have recommendations for us. And it's been great because, <laughs> you know, just word of mouth. And also I've been, um, you know, I asked my friends too. I have, well, maybe you can give me some suggestions. <laughs> uh, but um, they've been like, hey, Stephanie, you know, I was in this production. Um, how about this aria? It's like I'm workshopping it right now. And so that's how we've been getting some arias from the baritone anthology, which has just been so great because there's so many new works that are being developed right now, and it really, there is no online presence for Canadian opera, which is a shame. So, um, yeah, so that's kind of how we've been getting stuff, word of mouth and just sifting through everything. Yeah, thanks. I'll just add a bit more to that, because um, I'm actually more involved in the baritone and bass. <laughs> Stephanie, I just took her work, and she was the, the impetus, and now, in this, the baritone and bass uh, version, what we're doing is, we, I brought on Dr. John Beckwith, and he's an encyclopedia. I mean, he knows more. As I say to um, my, uh, my editor and assistant, Alan and Stephanie, I say, he knows more than all of us put together. <laughs> so I went to uh, John Beckwith, and I said, um, you know, can you recommend things? Well, he gave me a list as, almost as long as my arm, Check this, check that. So I went again to the music center and I ordered scores and looked through them and then you know we started sifting them out and finding recordings and drilling down into what we ought to put in. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I would think that I'm not I'm not a composer, but uh, there are obviously many many Canadian composers. Have the composers themselves been contacting you, informing you of new operas or? Do you, is it possible to set up a composer hotline that connects all the composers?
composers that if their writing is opera, they could uh, contribute? Okay, so Joy has asked about whether you know the composers are contacting us directly. Uh, the answer I can say is no. We're finding them, and we're because you know they're off in their world, and we're in our world, and they don't really know what we're doing. So I've actually, through the process we've been following, I have been emailing them and saying, you know, look, we're interested in this, or I have contacted some composers and said, um, would you like to recommend something from your uh, repertoire? And uh, I, we have received some through that, and most of the composers are like, really, somebody's interested in my aria? And there was like some of these that are like 20, 30 years old, and they're saying, really? I'll have to dig through my stacks and find it. <laughs> that, it would be a fabulous service. If composers knew, it might be a really fine way for finding a repertoire. And yeah. they would be thrilled beyond words at the opportunity. That is part of our aim, is to have composers, uh, you know, the more people, like having, that's one reason why I wanted this workshop, because now you know about it, where you didn't know about it, and you know, it's, it's often I'm discovering, because I've been, I've been a music publisher for a lot of years, and generally I find that uh, one of my colleagues said, you know, she's a promotion person. You throw everything, you throw as much as you can kind of against the wall and see what sticks, and the, because generally what's happening is people, it's, it's more personal contact. I'm discovering that person to person is the most effective promotional method. One person talks to another person, you can put an ad in the book and then people flip past it and they ignore it. It's gotta be one person telling another person, look, I found this resource, you know, you gotta look at it. That's the most effective. Okay, any other questions? I'm going to ask my question right here because it's sort of long and I don't want anyone to have to repeat it. Uh, and I want to start by, I mean, my name is John Burge. I helped organize this, but I'm also a composer pianist and great friend of Victor Davies. And the first thing I have to say is for Canadian music and for what we need to happen in the world today, this is an unbelievable program. <laughs> right up, okay? uh, second thing, though, and this is me as a composer who, you know, somewhat answers uh, Joy's, Joy's comment is um, could, when you write an opera, it's covered under grand right. So it's, it's not the same process that you have when just writing you know, a short song, which is easy to put in the Canadian Music Center. So I, in fact, have a one-woman show and a chamber opera that are both enormous, and you know, I got them from the air, got them done, but I've got so much paperwork to go back and edit them. It's unbelievable. So, so the problem often is, I think that, you know, Bless your heart if you find things in the Canadian Music Center, but as you've alluded to, there's so many things that aren't in the Canadian Music Center mm -hmm. because you, you can't really submit something that that's large, especially if you want to do some other edits. <laughs> so um, uh, all I'm just going to say is it's not really a question because I think you've, you've already answered it, but, but it's the process of getting it started right now that will really produce great dividends further down the road. But, but it's a big road, you know? And the good news is, more and more people are writing operas. It's really an exciting forum. It's, it seems to be embracing exclusivity, uh, indigeneity, like everything is being put in there because it all comes together. So mm. just keep up the good work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, is there any chance of having a, a recording of these songs in the, in the anthology? Well, I would love that to happen, and I'm looking for singers who are willing to <laughs> record them and allow me to put it on my YouTube channel so that I can, I can, you know, more people can hear it. Because really, that's why this is being videotaped today, because I knew that it would be a limited number of people here. And I brought Stephanie all the way from Vancouver, and I thought, I'm not going to waste her time for just this one little thing. It needs to have a bigger life. And so hence the reason that's being videotaped. And yeah, and I'm hoping that we will have more recordings. And that's why this is in print, because as Stephanie has told us, you know, if you can't get the music, then you can't sing it. Any other questions? Is there contact information in the book? 
Uh, my contact information is on the ad, oh, the ad right okay. there. Oh, perfect. Thank you. There's my ad. And do you want to do the promo stuff? Yes. Come up here and talk. Okay. So, if there's no more questions, I guess now I'm actually going to be an official speaker. I'll take my mask off. <laughs> but I wanted to show you, just in closing, here's, oh, let's put this thing here. Here, I've, I brought physical copies, and I'm selling them at my booth in, um, in the hall, and you're welcome to it. I have a special going on, taxes included in all my stuff, and if you buy uh, $70 worth of product or more, you are entitled to get, I've made, I'm also a professional sewer. <laughs> so I have made some special tote bags. And these are tote, these are all cotton. I have them in four different colors. Beige and kind of a very warm gray and yellow with a music theme pocket on it. One's a bird and one's flowers with a treble clock. And I welcome you to my booth and to uh, purchase my music and see all the other things that I have. I'm also doing a workshop co-sponsoring with Long and McQuaid tomorrow, the music of Larissa Kuzmenko. And she will be here, and that will be very interesting. So I welcome you back. Thank you. And I also want to especially thank Joy because she stepped in at the last instant. When, when Victor was not able to be here, and I thought, how am I going? She was going to be the pianist, you see. And he said, I can't make it. And I thought, where am I going to find a pianist? And Joy came to the rescue. Thank you, Joy. <laughs> Yes, let's give them a round of applause. <laughs> so, yeah, thank you so much. Um, I just want to share the um, next event that will be happening here. It will be 1.30, the Red Leaf Piano Works. So be sure to come back to see that. Uh, there's also the music theater competition happening at 1.30 in the concert hall. That's just across the road on this side. So, yeah, just enjoy your lunch break and be sure to visit the trade show. Thank you so much. <laughs>